But Mark chapter 8, verse 11 says this, Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with Jesus, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? For surely I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them, and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. And then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned themselves. It is because we have no bread. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would just fill us with the word of God. Your word is living and active. We believe it. We, we believe it's just independent of, of, of me or it, and, and in spite of my flaws, in spite of whatever it is about me that would hinder your word gets into the human heart and it, it, it explodes, it takes effect, it's saturated, it changes, it divides bone and marrow. And Lord, we look to you for your word to do that today. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you may be seated. So Jesus had just fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread and a few small fish. And soon before that, he, in a different place, he fed over 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. In verse 11, we see the Pharisees uh, go out to test Jesus again, these The Pharisees are strict, legalistic, religious people who had real problems with the kind of people who were following Jesus. That is, people who were dirty. They had a personal history with sin. People who had no religious education. They were like sheep without a shepherd. The Pharisees were repulsed by those people, uh, and and a prophet wouldn't wouldn't dirty himself with these people. Who is this guy? They had heard about miracles. They go out demanding a sign. Verse 12 uh, says that Jesus sighed deeply, meaning the request that they gave him, show us a miracle, Jesus, even though it came from, uh, it, it came from really a, a wicked heart of rejection and unbelief. It, he sighed deeply. His heart broke for them, broke for these rebellious people. If you're here in rebellion, his heart is breaking for you. You know, eventually we're going to get to where he comes into Jerusalem. Luke 19 says, when Jesus, he, he wept for, uh, for these same people that are coming out asking, demanding a sign, he wept for them. Again, hearts broken for them. And he said, if you, even you, in this your day, had known what would bring you peace, He was referring to himself. Only Jesus can bring peace to the human heart. And but weeping, he said, if you had known what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. And again, they're here in Mark 8 asking for a miracle. Verse 12, uh, Jesus says no. And then in verse 13, it says that Jesus left. Verse 13, first four words, and he left them. I pray, my prayer is that reading that would make your heart shudder. God does this. 
He says in Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. When you seek me and find me, God says. The problem with the Pharisees in verse 11, it says they were not seeking Jesus. They were seeking a sign. Again, verse 11, it says, Then the Pharisees came out, began to dispute with him, seeking a sign, seeking a miracle. They weren't seeking Jesus. They didn't want Jesus. As far as they were concerned, they didn't need Jesus. So when they ask him for a sign, a miracle, he just says no. And then immediately it says he left them and got in the boat and took off. Now, I wouldn't be doing my job as a teacher of God's word if I didn't tell you that if you're here, not because you want God, if you're not here because you need God, you may want something from God, but you don't want him. If that's you, you're in a dangerous place. The Bible says at some point, if you do that long enough, he will leave you. It says that in the Bible repeatedly. And he will, he will leave you to your own desire. And at that point, you will no longer even have any interest in God. You will still, you'll, you'll wonder, hmm, why? I, I, you know, I used to kind of like going to church or whatever. I, 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 I don't even care about God anymore. It's because he left you. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Isaiah 55. Repeated also in Psalm 32. Actually, Psalm 32 came first. David says, seek the Lord while he may may be found in Psalm 32. Have you ever, question for you, on this year Father's Day, Have you ever in your life seriously sought the Lord? Not sought something from Him. We just saw what happens when someone just comes to Him, comes to Him, just seeking something from Him. I mean, seriously seeking Him. If not, you need to seek Him now. You need to seek Him now. Uh, Again, um, Isaiah 59, uh, verses 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. What what does that mean, wicked? It means your whole relationship with God is based upon going to him and asking him for a miracle. That's wickedness. The Bible has a different definition of wicked than what we think. It says, let the wicked uh, forsake his way and the righteous man his, uh, rather the unrighteous man his thoughts, let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. And at that point, your salvation is secure. He's never going to leave you or forsake you, at that, forsake you at that point. But so important that that God doesn't mess around. He broke into human history to seek and save what was lost. But if there is repeated rejection of him, if your relationship is with God has just been based upon really for all your life as mine was for the first really 24 years of my life, just getting something from God, beware because he may leave you. Leave you to your own desire. That's what the Bible teaches. Mark, uh, but, but again, in verse 13, it says he left them, and, and it says, and it, read along with me now, he left them, and getting into the boat again, he departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread And they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. The interesting thing about the book of Mark, (laughs) that uh, there's a lot about Jesus and boats. Now, I grew up with boats, and uh, uh, because uh, my dad always had a boat, and uh, um, I've spent a lot of time in boats, so I kind of like that. Uh, He's often in boats, in fact... um, 
19, 17 times up to this point, there's been a reference to a boat. Nine times he's in it. He's in a boat. And, and, and uh, most, if not all of the time, he's in the boat with his disciples. I think even when he's teaching, there's good reason to believe he's with his uh, disciples there. And it almost appears to me that the Holy Spirit's making a point with so many references to the disciples being in the boat. It seems like there's a message there. And the message is this, are you in the boat with Jesus? Really simple. Are you in the boat with Jesus? It's not why. Get in the boat with Jesus, the Holy Spirit is saying. So in verse 15, Jesus, um, he has a conversation with them in the boat. It's not like they get in the boat and then they're like, until they get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, they're talking uh, during the whole time they're in the boat. So let's read um, what goes on uh, in the boat. Well, actually, let's re- first read um, verse 14. It says, Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Verse 15, Then Jesus charged them, saying, Take heed, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Beware. He's he's charging them. Meaning, listen, this is serious, guys. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees who we just left. I just left them. And beware of of the leaven of Herod. Now, what is, what's up with leaven? Leaven is that yeast that you put into dough. Now, I've never done it, but I understand you knead it into the dough, and when you uh, bake the dough, the yeast, the leaven causes the dough to rise and expand and turn into a loaf of bread. Well, leaven or yeast spreads through the dough and causes it to expand. Leaven in the Bible is more or less synonymous with what? Someone shout it out. Sin. Sin. That's correct. I don't think every time, but, but usually it's synonymous with sin. So again, he says, beware, verse 15, of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. So that begs the question, what is the leaven of the Pharisees? What is the leaven of Herod? Well, the best way I can describe the leaven of the Pharisees, remember, they're the, the, the strict religious uh, uh, people uh, who came out to Jesus. The best way I can describe the leaven of Pharisees is to quote Jesus himself in Matthew 23 when he was speaking to them, verse 7, he says, woe to me, you, meaning you're in big time trouble, Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but on the inside you're full of dead men's bones. (laughs) Wow. So the leaven of the Pharisees uh, is, is, it's when, you know, if you've been leavened with it, with the leaven of the Pharisees, you're, you're putting on a, a front on the outside, a religious front. You wear the right clothes. Uh, your clothes look modest. Uh, uh, you, you show up to church on time. You pay money to the church. You don't drink. You don't smoke. You, you, um, you, you, you don't watch TV. You, you don't listen to nasty secular music. And you make sure everyone who, uh, that knows you that they know that you don't do those things. The inside, however, no love. You are like, inside there's dead men's bones. No love of Jesus, no love of people. Dead men's bones. I've seen a lot of pharisaical leaven in church communities around the country during COVID. No love. Just a lot of screaming and yelling. What's the leaven of Herod? Exactly the opposite. You remember Herod. He had the big party with the exotic dancer that he, he really liked, and he made a big-time promise to her. He said, whatever you ask, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. 
And, and I said, what a ridiculous promise. Why do you think he asked that? I mean, take one good guess. Please, please get it right. Okay, pride. I'm going to get in trouble with my wife again. Well, that's right. He's, he's drunk. He's drunk. That's why he made that. He, he, he made it because he's drunk. The leaven of, uh, uh, of, of Herod is the idolatry of pleasure, sex, alcohol, money, power. None of those things evil in and of themselves, but there's an idolatry to it. That's the leaven of, of, of Herod. And Jesus really, really cares about this stuff. Calvary Chapel, if you get leaven with the leaven of the Pharisees, the Bible says the glory departs from you. Your fruitfulness departs. If you get leaven with the leaven of Herod, his glory, the glory of Jesus Christ, departs from you. He really cares about his glory being manifest in your life. So he charges them, please avoid the leaven of the Pharisees and avoid the leaven of Herod because if you allow that kind of leaven to get into you, pretty soon you'll be trying to get out of the boat. Now, the main part of this message is, is not about leaven of, of, the, of the Pharisees and, and leaven of Herod, but, but I, just one, one other point. Notice how they're opposite. Do you notice that? And they're opposite from each other. Le, leaven of Pharisee and the leaven of, um, uh, of Herod. And, and so here's, here's what's really difficult. If you're not being led by the Holy Spirit, here's what's really difficult. Your one reaction is to say, you know, Herod's a really nasty guy. I, I, I just really, really nasty dude. This, this, this drunk guy slobbering over this woman. I, I, you know, I, so I'm just going to get rid of my TV and come to think of it, you know, anyone who doesn't get rid of their TV should not call themselves a, a, a Christian. What just happened? In order to avoid being a Herod, you become a what? A Pharisee. And, or this happens. Those Pharisees, they're so nasty. I never want to be a Pharisee. So I'm just going to watch whatever kind of TV I want and as much t of TV as I want. So what happened? In order to be, avoid being a Pharisee, you become a what? A Herod. That's exactly right. So, so how, do you, uh, how, how do you avoid that? Staying in the boat with Jesus. Just staying in the boat with Jesus, feeding off of Jesus. In the book of John, Jesus says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you cannot be my disciple. This is really weird. A bunch of people leapt him when he said that. What does that mean? It's just feeding off of his word, feeding off of each other in the body of Christ. And the Christ in you, Ephesians 5.19 says, when we get together... Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Look, you know, I'm really happy that last night the Brooklyn Nets lost. I'm really happy about that. But, but, but guess what? If that is where I draw my life from, the NBA, and I've been playing basketball my whole life, if that's where I'm drawing my strength from, you know, I'm, I'm convinced if Jesus was here today, he would be at an NBA game or a soccer game or whatever. He'd be with the people, but he sure would not be drawing life from that. He'd draw life, why? He went to deserted places. We've already been multiple times in the book. He went to desert places and he drew strength from his father. You stay in the boat and you draw your life from Jesus Christ. So again, beware of the leaven of of the Pharisees and beware of the leaven of Herod. Now, what happens? What happens? Verse 16. There's like a crazy misunderstanding. There's a complete disconnect. It says in verse 16, it says they, the disciples, they're in the boat. So remember, there's a bunch of these guys. There's 12 of them in this boat. And there's a bunch of disciples on sort of on the other end of the boat, probably whispering to themselves. And, say that, and it says, verse 16, they reasoned among themselves, saying, it is because 
we have no bread. In other words, they heard him use the word leaven, and it's like, oh, whoa, leaven? Leaven bread? Oh, he thinks we have no bread? And what happened? How many, pe- how many loaves of bread did they have? One. Verse 14 says they have one. They, they had all that extra bread, and they forgot they brought one loaf of bread. And now they're, they're going, oh, no, we don't have any bread. And, he, and, and God himself, Je- or rather, I should say Jesus himself, I don't know that they had an understanding of he was God at this point, but, but, um, but, but the Son of God, the Messiah himself, uh, he, he's worried. He's worried that, uh, uh, that we don't have any bread. Now, what's, what is the problem with that? What's the problem with that? He just fed 4,000 people with just a few loaves and a few fish. And right before that, with a completely different set of people in a different place, they saw him feed over 5,000 with just a few loaves and a few pieces of bread. So, what does he say? Verse 17. He said, because, but Jesus, being aware of it, being aware of what? That they thought he was talking, when he's talking about leaven, he's talking, he's really wanting to to disciple him and mentor him here, you know, beware of legalism, beware of the spirit of the world. They're not even listening. They say, oh, we must meet leavened bread. Oh, we don't have any bread. Jesus, being aware of it, verse 17, said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Verse 18, having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to him, 12, verse 20. And when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. And so he said to them, how is it that you do not understand? So let's get real simple here. The great thing about the book of Mark is there's just very simple, really profound truth in it over and over again. Remember how tough Jesus was with the Pharisees in verse 12. They came to him asking for a miracle, and he just says, no, no, I'm not going to give that to you. In the book of Matthew, we know that he said at the same time, this is a, you're a wicked and adulterous generation. He says, no. Really tough. But notice in verse 17 through, through 21, uh, Jesus is really tough with the disciples. I mean, really, really tough. I mean, this is, this is brutal. Here, nine questions. I, I like lists, in case you haven't figured out. I, I like lists. And this is a, these are nine questions. And, and how, 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 how slowly do you think he was speaking when he asked these questions? I think he was r- speaking very, very slowly. Why do you reason that you have no bread? He just waited. Made them, in a loving way, lovingly made them feel real uncomfortable Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, How many baskets full of fragments did you take up?
When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? How is it that you do not understand? That's, he's, he's tough on the Pharisees. He's really tough on the Pharisees. He's really tough on his disciples. What's the difference? What's the one, obvious, again, get really simple. What's the one difference of how he deals with the Pharisees and he deals with his followers? Shout it out, someone. Really simple, obvious. That's right. The Pharisees, he left them because of their heart. They weren't seeking him. But he stayed in the boat. He didn't say, I, I'm just done with this. I'm done. I fell. I, I, um, fed so many thousands of people, I've done me jump into the water and swim away. He did not do that. He, he stayed in the boat with them. He didn't leave them. Once you have gotten into the boat, he's not going to do that. Now, why? Why does Jesus not going to bump, jump out of the boat? We've already said it because he really, really cares about you and manifesting his glory in your life. He really cares about you being transformed into his likeness. Remember Romans 8, 29. Those whom he foreloved, foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ so that he, Jesus, would be the first among many brethren. He really cares about your fruitfulness. He cares about, your, uh, about the glory of God being manifest through your fruitfulness. Jesus says to the disciples right before he was taken away to be crucified, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And guess what? When your anxiety, it kills God's glory. It kills your fruitfulness. Your anxiety does that. The glory departs. Not His presence, not the Holy Spirit, but it departs from you. How am I going to do this? When am I going to find time to do this? Where can I possibly find the resources? There's no glory of God resting on your life. And listen, I'm not here to make anyone feel condemned. I'm anxious this morning. This is guilty of it as anybody in here. But it, his glory departs, and he really cares about his glory. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Someone sent me this this week, a, a little devotional on Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct your path. And so this little devotional that someone sent me this week has this commentary on this verse. Can, can, we, can we get that, uh, Josue? When the Bible says, do not lean on your own understanding, listen, Calvary Chapel, listen to this. This is important. When the Bible says to says, do not lean on your own understanding, the Bible's being serious. It's not like a quaint little saying. God's being real serious. He wants to see that glory rest and remain on your life. Your heart is deceitful. Your emotions go up and down. Your understanding does not see the big picture. God never lies. He never changes. God knows all. Trust him. The problem is because, I, I, I really like this devotional because it gets to a very important point. The heart is deceitful, your emotions go up and down, your understanding doesn't see the big picture. Josue, can we see the, the chart again? And, and as a result of that, guess what? It, we start reasoning among ourselves, our reasoning gets twisted. Why? Because our emotions get involved and it becomes all twisted. It, 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 the, the third bullet there. It, 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 is your heart still hardened? Same thing happens. Our, 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 our emotions go up and down. 
our, our heart is deceitful, and, and as a result, th that has a hardening effect on, on our lives. It says, having eyes, uh, do you not see? Even seeing things, we start seeing things in a twisted way. Why? Because we don't understand the big picture. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Hearing things, we can hear. We can hear clearly um, you know, God moving in our lives, we saw it, we heard it, but then the, our, our, our memory, it goes on to say at the very below, uh, or it says, do you not remember there? Even our memory, it, it, it just gets all bent out of shape and twisted. But why? Because our heart's deceitful, our, our, our emotions go up and down, they're all wacky, um, you know, throughout the day, and, and, and as well, we just don't see the big picture, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. He's really tough on you. Let me, let me tell you, you're in the boat with Jesus. Jesus is going to be really tough with you. Did you hear that? He's going to be really tough for, with you from time to time. Why? Because he loves you and he cares and he wants his glory to remain upon you. Some of you may be in a place. He's being tough on you. It's because he loves you. He wants his glory to rest upon you. Your anxiety's killing it. Remember how they had one loaf. They had one loaf. I'm going to conclude with this. Remember they had one loaf? One loaf. I was reading this week that uh, Jeff Bezos' former wife, i got to be careful because there's Amazon employees in this room, but his former wife, Mackenzie uh, Scott, tragically, they were divorced very publicly. This is such a terrible thing. You, you, divorce is bad enough, but when it's all over the papers, I just my heart reaches out to both of them. But th this woman... Uh, wound up with $60 billion, 4% of Amazon, as a result of, um, as a result of, of the divorce. And um, it's really admirable what she's doing. She's, she's, she's made a commitment to get rid of the money fast, to, to, to actually get rid of it all before she dies and start really, really fast. She, um, she gave away $6 billion. <laughs> Is that crazy? Already in 2020, already this year, she's given um, away $3 billion. And she's given it to arts groups, racial justice groups, dance theaters, colleges, El Paso Community College. They just got a whole bunch of money. I don't know, I don't know how much. Uh, any, any alumni here? Uh, University of Central Florida, I don't know how they picked that, but that's where my niece is. They just got a big old grant themselves. Um, and, and so uh, it, she, she's given it away. But, you know, as I, I didn't see anything in her list, and this is not a criticism. Pray for her that she would have wisdom. And this is a good thing. But I didn't see any of that in there to an organization that spreads the good news of Jesus Christ, that the, mainly that, that, that the wrath of God hangs over the United States of America and the city of Boston, but, and only through Jesus Christ can you escape the wrath. Didn't see any of those groups there. And I was thinking, well, whoa, you know, I, 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 what would happen if, if, if like a group that spread the gospel got one of these grants for whatever, $400 million. Well, I got to tell you, I don't think it's ever going to happen. And you know why? God doesn't operate like that. Why? Because he needs one loaf. He needs one loaf. Uh, many of you are, have, have started reading the Charles Finney book about the revival in the early 1830s, uh, or in the early 1800s. It took one guy, one guy, to uh, really... Uh, you talk about the very goals of her, of her grants are just for the betterment of humanity. You read this book, it is unbelievable how much goodness spread as the gospel was preached, and it started with one guy, one dude. God needs one loaf. Or if, it, it, you know, if in his best, in his great wisdom, he may even go up to 100. One of my all-time favorite quotes, uh, Charles Wesley, Charles, I mean, rather, John Wesley. Charles was the guy who wrote the hymns. John Wesley um, said this, give me 100 preachers 
who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I care not a straw, whether they be clergymen or laymen. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of God uh, of heaven on earth. That's all God needs. He does not need a grant from a rich philanthropist. He needs one person. He needs you. In a, a better way of saying, rather than he needs you, he's chosen you. He's chosen to do things in a different way. He, man's not going to get the glory when revival comes. There's not going to be like, oh, wow, the, the founder of this tech company uh, stirred up a revival. Uh, could happen. I don't, based upon my understanding of the word of God, it's not going to happen. It's going to be the least of the least of the least getting on fire for the Lord, say, uh, right here, fearing nothing but sin and desiring nothing but God. That's how he gets things done, John Wesley. We started off where? The very, what I would call terrible, and I, and I, I use that, 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 um, that phrase like the Puritans used to use it, not, not literally, but the terrible truth, no truth is terrible, but it's terrifying is the sense truth that God does leave when he is approached over and over again with a pattern of, of just coming to him. Not because you're seeking him, but because you're seeking, you're seeking something from him, if that has defined your life. That defined my life for the first 24 years of my life. If, if that has defined your life and you just want to stop that, the Bible does say, seek the Lord while he may be found. And you want to put an end to seeking God merely from what he can give you, but rather you just want to you realize, man, I need to seek God for who he is. He's God. He can require anything of me that he wants, and he's required my life. So I want to give my life to him. If that's you, I want you to come up. Um, I, I want you to, if we can just have an instrumental at this point. I want you to come up, and I'll be up here. I'll be up here with um, Stephanie, my wife. If you, uh, by the way, if you if you speak Spanish, we, Oscar and B are there, and they speak Spanish. But we want to. Um, once you rise for the, just for the closing worship song, just just please rise. But then we've also just prayed. Anything else that has stirred your heart that you want prayer for? the leaven of the Pharisees just putting up a religious front where you know full well you, you're, not, you're not secure in the boat with Jesus or the leaven of Herod this is just the world leaven of the world just want prayer for that It'd be an honor for us to be able to pray for you during this closing worship song about that Maybe you were just stirred based upon that really relentless nine questions where Jesus is saying, you have eyes, but you're not seeing. You have ears, but you're not hearing. You have a mind but you're, and a memory, but you're not remembering. And, and you know your anxiety. The, there's a pattern of anxiety in your life that has been killing the glory of God or rather, a better way of putting it, preventing the glory of God from resting on you. It's coming up for prayer. You can come up at this time. I'm going to close in prayer. We're going to begin to worship. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus, thanking you, thanking you, thanking you, Lord. 
for drawing us to you today in Jesus' name.